with the Philippines in the number one or number two position in many sectors of the BPO industry, it's not surprising that there are Filipinos in their global management. With us today is Gilbert Santa Maria, he is COO of IBEX Global. Gilbert, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You've uh, worked in, in several uh, BPOs before coming to IBEX. Yes. Let's talk about the industry first. Um, what is the main challenge to the industry right now? The main challenge to the industry globally is uh, growth looking for places that can support the Western world primarily um, with quality people. And the largest market is the English-speaking market serving the United States. And there aren't that many countries that speak English where the cost is reasonable. And obviously the Philippines and India stand out among those countries. Absolutely. Um, uh, other countries uh, used to stand out, but those are the two strong ones. We hear a lot about how in the Philippines, for example, it's becoming very tough to hire because uh, there are so many BPOs here. Uh, there's a saturation. Of, there's a kind of saturation in the market. How difficult is that challenge? The challenge is difficult because of competition, but also because the response of um, the education sector to the demand has not been quite as rapid as uh, as we'd have liked. But the response is there. Right. A lot of what happened in the last 12 years that I've been in this industry was the excess capacity of the marketplace has been sucked up by BPOs. But we define the marketplace as English-speaking Filipinos, Filipinos who are very capable in both languages, right? it's particularly English. And uh, there aren't that many left after you employ a million plus in the industry. So even with 200,000, 400,000 graduates every year, there's demand, there's a great deal of competition for people who can qualify in the industry. So it, it mostly started in the Metro Manila area. Obviously right. in the past few years, we've seen it really spread in, in the provincial areas. Um, is even that becoming short supply? It uh, depends on the provincial area you're in. I just visited a couple of provincial cities. And uh, the issue in the provincial cities is you don't have, you don't have that many pool of graduates. You still have a good deal of graduates who come to Manila and Cebu the two big hubs for BPOs. And so you're left with the people who stay in their home cities, um, Caliente Oro, Naga, Bacola, Tumaguete, Iloilo, who are then employed by BPOs. The schools in those, um, in those cities are responding by improving training in English, improving training in communications and analytics and, and technical skills. But the demand is much greater than the supply. You've, ta you've talked about earlier how the response hasn't been fast enough. Could you tell us in terms of what kinds of response you were looking for or are looking for and how it could be speeded up? So there's been a very interesting development recently that um, Ayala Corporation recently acquired the University of Nueva Caceres. That should have happened years ago. You know, there are, FINMA owns a great good deal of universities, but converting that from you know, being able to move the industry from looking at the parents of students as the primary driver of demand to the employers as the primary driver of demand, that shift is only beginning to take place. Now that the schools see if they can train graduates who will end up being gainfully employed, that the schools themselves will do significantly better financially, the aha moment will the light bulb goes off, right? So when you say that something should have happened a long time ago, it's businesses taking over schools? Or schools becoming schools more... running like businesses. Right. Right. I mean, the graduates mm -hmm. of Ateneo, UP, La Salle, they populate the leadership ranks of, of the BPO industry today. I'm a UP graduate. But there are many UP graduates who would choose not to be in the BPO industry because there's plenty of demand for them elsewhere. There are many, many, many other schools with very high quality people who are now leaders in the industry. There just aren't enough of those graduates that you know the demand doesn't outstrip supply. Let's take a wider view for, um, for, for a minute. Uh, we started by looking at the global picture. So you were saying that uh, it's becoming difficult to find uh, people to man these BPO centers, um, even in the Philippines and India, for example. Um, are there other countries that are emerging as possible suppliers in this panel? Absolutely. Um, I'm wearing this wristband with the colors of the Jamaica flag. <coughs> so I'm, I have a hundred people plus in training in Jamaica and we're setting up a building there. I'm also, we also went live in uh, Managua, Nicaragua with an English speaking team. I'm sending Filipinos to both places to help train and 
develop those markets. In the past, I've been in South Africa, Ireland, and um, other parts of South America and Africa. Is it, is it obvious where you should be going? Well, you have pools of English. Okay. You'll, you'll have some <coughs> obvious pools to go look at. Um, but then, once you leave the English-speaking world, you're looking at North Africa for French. Uh, we, have, we operate in Senegal to serve the French-speaking market. And for German and European languages, it's Eastern Europe. And How do you North assess? Africa. Because some, some areas will stand out as possible uh, locations. How do you assess that that area is a place where you can have several thousand people in a couple of years? We're really looking at the pool of people who, the profile of people who could potentially be agents. Right? So, you know, Philippines and India look obvious. But once you figure out, do, we, do they have the bandwidth, the internet, the, the, the high-speed communications bandwidth to serve the marketplace, and that's usually important, right? Um, for a little while, for the longest time, you couldn't go to some provincial cities because they never they didn't have enough bandwidth to take the phone volume, and that's changed. But then it's access to the people that's the biggest issue always. There is some... Um, global economy is kind of mixed. The U.S. is picking up. Most of the rest of the world is growing to a slower pace than it used to grow. Is that a factor for the BPO industry? Absolutely, though. The BPO industry is driven by demand by our clients. So our clients are large corporates around the world. Man, speaking collectively as the entire industry, it's all the big brands you know, right? Financial Services, Citibank, Bank of America, uh, HSBC, etc., telecoms, AT&T, Sprint, Right, British Telecom, etc. Those, all those companies are affected by market cycles, and their suppliers are, are too. But is the <coughs> is it, does it sometimes work in your favor if they're not doing so well? They'll want to outsource more, and therefore it's good for you. That used to be the case. What's happened today is there's now a balance between demand for onshore service and offshore service. Onshore being Americans serving Americans, for example. And the demand for that has been stable. So for IBEX, for example, I have more people in the U.S. than in the Philippines, mainly because of demand from my clients for service in the continental United States. Why do they still want Americans to be served by Americans? It's not just cost. It's a, lot, a lot of it is um, because the language and the cultural barriers are very low and the technical skills are available. Mm -hmm. You have a higher quality service or the perception of higher quality services is more appropriately described. Filipinos can't communicate enough? It's not the accent. <laughs> it's the ability, to, um, the ability to absorb information, process the information, and relay the information back uh, very how, rapidly. How about politics? Um, at least until a few years ago, there was, there was a backlash against outsourcing from countries like the U.S. That's correct. They're going through tough times. That's they didn't right. want to lose jobs. Has that abated? Abated is not probably the right way to describe it. It's become more understood that it's now a necessary part of being a globally competitive um, enterprise, that you have to have some of your capacity to support outside the continental United States. Yeah. If anything, one of the reasons why Mr. Trump is so popular in the United States is because he's been beating the drums for um, you know, more less offshoring, less outsourcing. Let's talk about um, one challenge or opportunity that one hears a lot about now. It's automation and how that can take over more and more BPO functions in the call center industry and in other parts of the BPO industry That's as well, right. I guess. Um, is that more of a challenge or more of an opportunity? It's both. So the technology is there. It's true and it's real. The thing about the call center industry, though, is the quality of the interaction between the customer and the agent that is very hard to replace by a machine. And so we found that even as the industry has put more technology in place, the quality of the agent matters more. And um, it matters even more now that there's so much more automation in place. So where will automation um, be really felt? In what parts of the BPO industry? So. One of the companies that I used to cover um, was a finance and accounting company. And the, the automation that, that uh, has, uh, has uh, improved productivity greatly is optical recognition, scanning documents. 
so that they can be reviewed by a machine rather than human beings coding things in. Huge impact in that industry. But at the end of the day, you end up having Filipinos interpreting the financials <laughs> still for the U.S. clients. So the Philippines should not be fearful that the call center industry will that. disappear. Well, because Filipinos are also very, um, in, in the BPO industry in the Philippines, because of the clients we work with, we end up being technologically literate as well. We have to be. If you have clients like AT&T and Sprint and Apple and Dell, you, know, you have to know technology, otherwise you won't be able to compete. So the growth rate in the Philippine BPO industry has come down. It used to grow 30% a year. That's come down to 20 or something like that. Is that because of demand or because of supply? I would venture to argue it's supply. But Meaning we don't have enough BPO agents? No, we're at the top of what you would describe as a classic business S-curve. Right? When we started, when I joined this industry in the early 2000s, there were a few tens of thousands of Filipinos in the industry. There were millions of Filipinos available for hire. Now that you have a million people in the industry and then supporting the industry, a few million more, there are far fewer millions of Filipinos available. <laughs> And so that's what's holding it. That's, that's what's, what's holding, holding down the. Uh, but the demand's yeah. still there. There are many American companies that have not even ventured outside the U.S. Once do you they think, start to go. Do you think the Philippines has reached a saturation point, or is very close to it? Saturation point in terms of people. No, we have 100 million citizens. Saturation in terms of quality of available graduates from high quality institutions. We're we're there. Right. The, the, both the government and the business sector has to respond to create greater supply in, in the education, uh, from education. We'll talk a bit more about that when we come back. More inside business when we come back. Stay with us. So we talked a bit about how schools and government are responding or not responding fast enough. If you were to tell schools and the government right now the one or two or three things that they have to do, uh, they have to focus on, what would they be? Their curriculum, the quality of the, you know, the input that they receive, that they train, and turning their education from a classroom-based, um, book-based learning to real-world experiential-based learning. Is any of that happening, this latter thing that you talked about? Absolutely. The, the example that I like the most is uh, UNC and the Ayala Corporation's entry into UNC. And the reason I plug that is I used to work for that group. Um, Live it. I literally used to work with them. Yeah. Stream, the company I came from, was owned 30% by Yala Corporation, right. even if I was while well, I was based in the U.S. And uh, Livet Investments sold that company to Convergence right. and went into education to supply the entire BPO industry, seeing that opportunity. And so the, the, the revamping the curriculum to reflect the ability for Filipinos to, to reflect the, the raw talent of the Filipinos with superior training. So it would seem like the private sector, parts of it, are responding. Yes, they are. How about the government? The government is responding. The government is dealing with a lot more fundamental issues. For example, what the education sector is facing today is the whole grade 11 and 12 issue. For the next couple of years, there will be a grade 11 and 12 coming and hitting the ground, which means supply of people leaving, edu graduating from education will slow down for, for a few years. So they're dealing with that. That's a massive, massive problem. In the meantime, the Philippines has a you know, very vibrant education sector, and they should respond. Let's talk about managing BPOs. First of all, you, you came from a, from a consumer goods company, uh, Pepsi, uh, before you moved into the BPO industry. How different is it to manage, uh, to be a manager in that kind of company and the BPO company? I started in consumer goods actually here in the Philippines at Unilever many, many, many years ago and then left for the United States. I became a consultant. I came back to work with PepsiCo and PepsiCo on the Pepsi in for a few years and then Guaco took over and then I left the Philippines again. And so I've been in multiple industries. The interesting thing about um, having experience outside the BPO industry is you understand fundamental business drivers. The interesting thing about working for a company like Pepsi, where when I was uh, GM many years ago, you had three unions, you know, thousands of people in the factory, hundreds of people out in the, in the trucks, 
on the streets, you learn how to manage people. So one, one of the reasons why I was successful in the retail industry is the ability to manage large numbers of Filipinos, but with a very Western business perspective. And managing BPOs, how is it different? It's people. It's obviously it's people again, but how are they different? Well, to, to tune a machine in manufacturing, you have a few mechanics, make sure that the belts are tight enough and that the gears are greased and that the electronic controls are working. Then you have six people manning a big line, for example, <laughs> maximum efficiency. To tune an operation where you have a thousand people delivering for a client, every single Filipino taking call has a different personality, different needs, different wants. They come in with, some may not have slept, some may have been dealing with recalcitrant children, you know. You have to manage all of that every single day. It makes it challenging, it makes it fun. And what uh, we hear a lot about is it's a very young, obviously it's a very young uh, staff that you have, that, mo that most BPOs have. Um, the term that people like to attach them is millennials. People usually mean that in a bad sense, in the sense that they feel entitled, etc. How true is that? Well, there is a certain sense of entitlement that you see, but that's, I see that mainly as me being an older person, looking at younger people and <coughs> thinking, wait, I used to be like them too. But were, did you feel entitled when you were their age? I probably was. People who looked at me who were <laughs> my age now probably thought the same about me back then. But what I see with, with a lot of the young people now is they seem more prone to switch jobs quickly, um, tired of, tire of doing this job, move to the next job, uh, not necessarily leave one job without necessarily having another job. Uh, I don't think we saw that in our time as much as you see it now. In our time, there were no jobs. There were no opportunities to That's do that. Correct. That's one of the reasons I left in the 80s. There, so, there were no opportunities. So it's not a millennial thing, it's an opportunity it's not a millennial thing. thing. I remember graduating from UP, getting a job at a multinational, and there were graduates from other universities who were taking daily labor wage rate jobs because they were not available for graduate engineers. Some of those daily labor engineers may have been smarter than you. Well, um, right now, if you work in one BPO, <coughs> you can quickly move to another BPO tomorrow, next month, in six That's months. Right. How do you keep them? You fight for their hearts and minds. That's the <laughs> only way you keep them. It's really you convince them that where you work is the one place where your career is going to grow. People don't leave bad jobs. They leave bad leaders. They leave bad environments. So you create an environment where people feel at home. If you that's, were to, that's a daily challenge. If you were to pick among the whole menu of things that you do to make people think, make your staff think this is a great environment to grow in, what would it be? You pick, you pick good leaders. <laughs> you train good leaders. You pick people who uh, make people feel welcome, make people feel at home. And so that, that's the one thing about the Philippines that makes it so um, ideal for BPOs. Yung ugali ng Pilipino na maalaga, right? Which is natural for Filipinos, maybe except for myself. But it's very natural, which means they take care of clients and more importantly, they take care of each other. What is the advantage and what is the disadvantage of being relatively small compared to some of your bigger competitors, some of whom you've worked with? I see it mainly as an advantage. Right? The, the, the large companies have clearly bigger balance sheets, more resources, more wherewithal. They also have big bureaucracy, slow decision making, and lack of responsiveness to clients. So we've been growing, IBEX, unusually for the industry, we've been growing 20-30% a year um, across the board because we're taking big chunks of business, mainly from the big, slower, uh, larger players. How does, the, how does a big balance sheet of a competitor, a bigger competitor, uh, give them an advantage over you? They can open a site tomorrow, just like that. Right? They'll put $2 million, $3 million in the ground in any location in the Philippines, or three, or five, or ten, and start hiring, and start hiring with larger signing bonuses, etc., to, to pull people in, which they have done. So, when you're pitching to clients, and you're, com you're pitching against these competitors, what's your selling proposition? You just said that you can act faster, but they can also act faster in terms of we can commit to build something. That's true. Yeah. Our specific pitch is we tell the clients that for our specific current clients, our teams in the Philippines are the best in the world. 
I have teams in Manila now that are in the top 10 out of 50 sites worldwide for a large telco. Right? And they're competing with American sites, they're competing with sites in Latin America and elsewhere, and they're beating them. So when they come to me, they come to me with what they want is more of what I can give them. Right. I would suspect you want to retain all the advantages of being small, That's meaning right. being nimble, but you want to grow to the size of some of those competitors. How are you going to get to that level? Uh, with great difficulty, but you know, eTelecare was the company that I started in this industry with many years ago. Ernest Ku was the chairman of SPI, which owned eTelecare. Freddie Ayala was essentially the CEO of eTelecare. And that company grew, listed on NASDAQ, merged with Stream, Stream became a billion two company, and then um, Convergys bought it for cash. Right? <laughs> Good success story. <laughs> I've seen the movie before, and, and I think we can do this again. Okay, Gilbert Santa Maria, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. That's Inside Business. Thanks for watching. See you next week.